If we could tune had to really be happening to surpass the Tennille and the Captain. The song had to be real and played with such feel that the singer could not be play acting. Newsflash people, it's 13th October 1975 and the top 10 this week is unreal. Wow! I'm not going to take a second longer. Let's launch into the heavy, heavy groove. And we're going to lead this week, as we will from now on, with the section that called Anastasia Palaszczuk last week and told her that her time was up. Hello and goodbye! New to the 10 this week, up from 19, is Paloma Blanca by that Dutch hit machine, George Baker Selection, which is in at 10. George Baker Selection hail from Assendelft, which is a little north of Amsterdam. Paloma Blanca was a huge hit, spending 30 weeks on the chart, 13 of them in the top 10 for a peak of three weeks at number two. It took the place of High Voltage by ACDC, which spent a solitary week at number 10, dropping off the charts at the start of November after 16 weeks. Next number one record this week is perched outside of our scope at number 11. It was number nine next week, then four, then the top spot for, well, I'll give you some idea. The song that knocks that song off number one won't debut on the charts until the 10th of November. As we've already established, George Baker's selection are in at 10 with Paloma Blanca, a cheery, sunny little song that had many of the oldies toes a tapping. Hans Bowens, who took the name George Baker after a detective in a story he enjoyed, was working in a lemonade factory, when, much to his surprise, his hobby band had a major international hit with Little Green Bag in 1970, and then a major local hit with Dear Anne. The band broke up and reformed a few times after 1978, and was still hitting the charts in Holland right up to 1987. It's not known whether George went back to his gig at the Lemonade Factory at any point in time. Still, God gave him lemons, and he made more than lemonade. Nine is the former six-week number one, Fox on the Run by Sweet, dropping down from four as part of a massive 29-week run on the charts. Sweet were having a really good late career rally. This was their second number one single for the year. Fox on the Run was the first single that had been written by the band themselves, very possibly also the last true classic of glam rock. And eight is that dirt-talking, beer-drinking, woman-chasing minister's son himself, Alice Cooper, with one of his anthemic songs, Department of Youth. Australia was defo the biggest market for this single. It got to number four. This week was its 20th on the chart, so it was a slow burner for sure. And it had 10 more weeks in it. Three more of them in the top 10 for five weeks all up. The album this came from, Welcome to My Nightmare, made number five and was one of the biggest sellers of the year. Seven is Sherbet with Life, from their rather pretty, really kind of sort of good album, Life is for Living. This is really the last vestige of their origins as a prog-inclined rock band, and like most of their songs, it has great pop hooks and hangs off the glorious bass of Tony Mitchell. 1975 was the year of the great Sherbet Skyhooks War. They both had number one hits, they both dominated Countdown on Sunday nights, they both toured every corner of the country, but in the end, Skyhooks had the edge with an 11-week number one album, and Ego is not a dirty word. However, it was Sherbet's greatest hits that knocked that off the number one perch. Sherbet would have reached their apogee the next year with a number one album and single with How's That. At six is the Status Quo Live EP, a three-songer from everybody's favourite greasy bedenimed oiks. And faves they must have been, 23 weeks on the charts for a high of three. Quo remained pretty popular until around the time I finished high school. There were always half a dozen or so stringy-haired stoners who'd write Quo on their middle three knuckles with a Nico pen, bobbing their heads to Down Down or Caroline and thinking no one was watching and judging them. High school was hell. Time now for the trade-up where we scour the lower reaches of the charts for records that should have made the top but didn't. And we have two beauties this week. Ian Hunter's swaggering, once bitten, twice shy, which only bumbled up to number 29. Great record, great performance. Hasn't got a hope in hell of being played today, of course. Too politically incorrect, you see. The second is another one of those records for which this series is made to feature. Jive Talkin' by the BGs, which incomprehensibly only made number 14. There may have, at this early stage, been some kind of anti-disco bias on the radio, I don't know, but 14 is completely unworthy of a record this great. The BGs talk the jive, but they couldn't get to number 5, which this week is held by the man that we can't seem to stop talking about, Glenn Campbell. He's parked his big hit Rhinestone Cowboy there up from number nine. It's a good song and all, and it's probably the one most people do associate with Glenn Campbell, but I can't help but think it pales a little to his collabs with Jimmy Webb. We were talking in episode 65 about Glenn's Galveston album. 
A few days after I wrote that episode, I was at my local monthly vinyl record market and I found a copy of the record. Score I went as I snaffled it. And then I looked at the vinyl and it looked like it had been cleaned by a pot scrubber. Nope, nope, a thousand nopes. Back it went. Number four is 10cc with I'm Not In Love, a record I never had much time for back when. I suspect it did get played a lot on nighttime shifts as DJs use the long run time for a toilet break or to smoke or something. But these days I can more willingly see the point of it. I suspect 10cc were playing the game on a slightly different level back then and I just wasn't sophisticated enough to see it. But now it seems kind of obvious. But bless them for trying. Anyway, never made number one. This was an era of very long-running number one hits. We had a four-week or a six-week or a ten-week, a solitary one-week after an epoch at number two, and a seven-week or ahead of us. But it did get to number three, and it enjoyed a relatively short run of 17 weeks. At three, dropping down from top spot is The Wonderful Love Will Keep Us Together by The Captain and Tennille. If by any chance you don't know this record, go right now to the playlist and dig it and it will not get out of your head. It is an absolute slamming earworm. Perfectly calculated pop music for the time. It spent a mere month on top. At number two, 1975 was the heart of Roller Mania, which took over from T-Rex to see and was soon to be crushed by Abba Mania. The Bay City Rollers weren't a bad band, they were more used to big breezy power pop stompers, but Give a Little Love was a tender ballad, clearly aimed at the swaying, scarf-holding poppets in the countdown audience, convincing them that the Rollers, of whom they dreamed of one day growing up to marry their favourite one, were really just sensitive widow boys who just needed a hug. Yeah. Two was as high as it got, spending three weeks as deputy chairman on the charts before it fell away. This was their second top ten, and they had five more ahead of them in a career that showed surprisingly in during popularity. Here are some amazing facts. Ants have no lungs. There are more people in California than Canada, but Canada is 2,000 times larger than California. Freddie Mercury was born with four extra teeth in his upper jaw. Here are some equally amazing facts. The biggest comer-upper on the week's this chart is The Love Game by John Paul Young, up 13 places to 16 this week, on his way to number four. If you like ACDC, then you can thank John Paul Young, because it was him, principally, plus to some extent Ted Mulry, who kept the Alberts label solvent during a period that ACDC lost them huge amounts of money. Ted Albert always had faith in the band, so he was happy, well, maybe not happy, but willing, to offset the money he made from the pop bankers like JPY to keep the ACDC machine moving. Yes, love is in the air, basically bankrolled highway to hell. And the biggest fall of this week is also 13 places for the Glitter Band with the Tears I Cried For You, which slumped to number 32 this week. Highest debutante was John Denver with Calypso coming in at 33, and the longest running record on the chart was Fox on the Run, which had been in the top 40 for 23 weeks. In the USA, Sadakamania was in full swing as Neil Sadaka's duet with Elton John, Bad Blood, ruled the charts this week. Sadaka had of course written Love Will Keep Us Together, the biggest hit of the year in 1975, and he also co-wrote, by the way, Ring Ring for ABBA, providing the English lyrics. In the UK, or the UK for short, one day to be beloved National Institution David Essex stood imperious with his sing-along he hold me close. This time last year, Paper Lace were number one with the egregious The Night Chicago Died. And this time in 1976, ABBA stood imperiously on top of the charts with their magnificent Dancing Queen in its sixth week on the top. The top album this week in town was Wish You Were Here by Pink Floyd, spending the first of its four weeks on the top. Hello. Have you ever wondered what's going on at the other end of the charts while we talk about all these fantastic songs in the top ten? I thought we might take a brief look this week at what was going on in the lower realms down at number 100 to number 89 and see what is flowing in those benthic depths. At number 100, it's one of the best band names ever. Disco Texan is Sex or Let's with I Want to Dance with You. It's pretty bad. I'm not entirely sure where the key centre in it is, and its vaguely 20s or 30s Hollywood flavour is off-putting. The lyrics make James Brown's stream of consciousness sound like high poetry, and Disco Tex is, as an MC, pain in the ass. Great band name, though. This was number 100 last week as well. Debuting at 99 is Sharon Stewart with Spinning and Spinning. 
a Stevie Wonder song. Three weeks on the charts, got to number 91. I assume she's a local artist given she's on RCA Australia, but bio is hard to find. If you're listening to Shazza, drop me a line. Another mystery is 98, who is Ray Gibson with the whole world SBIAB. It's a mystery which is really a riddle inside a conundrum. I'm familiar with the name Ray Gibson. He's an Australian too, and he may well be from Brisbane because it only charted here. It got to number 31. I'll ask my Facebook group if anybody knows anything. Like, what does SBIAB mean? I'm pretty sure it's not secondary bacterial infection acute bronchitis. 97, we have the mighty ZZ Top, debuting with one of my favourites, Tush. But it was off the chart next week. Number 96, and that will mean something which will no doubt elicit a smirk from Australians contemporaneous with this era, is a debut for Barry Manilow with Could It Be Magic, a song which took its sweet time making the charts, having been released in 1973, whereupon it spent eight weeks in the charts getting as high as number 70. See why, it's a bloody dirge. 95 is another debut from a band I could not stand as a youngster and still don't have a trove of fond memory for, Old 55, with their cover of Paul Anker's Diana. What I will say for the band is they were a training ground for a lot of good musicians who went on to far more meritorious pursuits. 94 is a pretty good one, Tears on My Pillow by Johnny Nash. It was only four weeks on the charts for the Nash, they're hitting number 69 in a hurry and then dropping like a stone. 93 is Andy Gibb with his debut single, Words and Music, which he wrote himself. Frankly, it isn't great. It only lasted a week on the charts. Andy sounds a lot like Robin on this record. 92 is a naked attempt to cash in on Sadaka Mania with New York City Blues by Neil Sadaka. We weren't having any of that Tommy Rot though, and we tossed it off the charts after two weeks where a it was probably replaced by the US number one Bad Blood, which made it all the way to number 11. 91 is our old friend Digby Richards with his version of Raincoat in the River falling down from number 75. Good song, still a staple on easy listening stations these days. Number 90 is the mighty funky KC and the Sunshine Band debuting with Get Down Tonight, which would get disco floors rumbling through the new year. This one only got to number 44 because it was overtaken in the new year by That's The Way I Like It, which went all the way to number 5. And finally, at number 89, is James Taylor's bland cover of Marvin Gaye's How Sweet It Is, which is dropping out of the charts after a so-so run that culminated at number 35. Monty's still in the big house, so we have the guy who plays the bongos and the Scooby-Doo chase scenes back. So come on, Mr. Music, lay down some beats at a dope so my monkey buddy won't drop the soap. The number one record this week is Rock Me by ABBA. Now, I'm using a national chart, so technically the A-side, I do, I do, I do, I do, I do, was the national number one. But in Brisbane, they didn't play that on the radio, and that wasn't listed on the charts. It was the B-side, Rock Me. The record is a great example of the music called Schlager, a style of music very popular in Germany. And at the time this was recorded, Germany would have been ABBA's biggest market. And they really didn't lose the Schlager style, Waterloo, Mamma Mia, King Kong Song, etc., until Arrival and Dancing Queen. Ring Ring is an outlier. It's pretty much aimed at the American market. The US remix horribly aimed at what they think American teens liked in 1973. Rock Me, a three-week chart topper, was replaced by Mamma Mia for 10 weeks, then SOS for a single week. So we wouldn't see anyone but ABBA at number one until mid-January when the Ted Mulry gang took over. 1976 would see ABBA at number one for 30 weeks. The last week of Mamma Mia's run, SOS's solitary week after seven weeks at number two, 14 for Fernando, eight for Dancing Queen, and six for Money, Money, Money. Rock Me is probably best remembered for its performance during ABBA's appearance on a local television special, which the band performed wearing blue satiny pyjama kimono type dealies. Agnetha, who didn't have much to do in the song, decided to stand with her back to the camera and sway her shapely satin clad bottom slowly back and forth in time with the beat. Suffice to say, that's all we boys could talk about at school the next day. And that, folks, is how the cow ate the cabbage in the week ending 13th of October 1975. It's been a fun week full of delight, surprise and mystery. And should the good Lord be a willing and the creeks don't rise, we'll be back with a fresh episode in another week. Hish. You. I don't know what that is, but I don't like it. <laughs>